Cool. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we're here for this talk, Evolving the Nux. This is the first contact postmortem. And for those of you who don't know what Nux means, Nux just means new user experience, which is really just another way of saying tutorial. Uh, my name is Dino Ignacio. And I'm Richard Wessler. And we're part of Oculus Rex. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to start off talking about the Touch Tutorial Initiative. And then we're going to show you our prototyping process. And then we're going to have a short little section about Touch Basics. And then we're going to delve deep into First Contact, which is what you're here for. And then we're going to close off with some lessons learned. Simple. Uh, before anything else, I did want to mention um, what Oculus Rex is. You probably might not know what that is. Oculus Rex is where we come from. We're a small team um, in Seattle, mostly, that um, focus on real-time experiences. Uh, Rex cheesily stands, stands for real-time experiences. I, I had to say it. <laughs> but um, anyway, our mission statement is to uh, we create real-time experiences that evangelize, inspire, and entertain. A little bit of history on the team. Uh, we were formed about three years ago. Um, here's a few of the people on the team. Um, we're made up of industry veterans from um, film and the games industry. And we've been tasked to be the team that creates first party content for Oculus. And we've made some amazing uh, demos and content that you may be familiar with. Yeah. So at Rex, we worked on a number of projects. Um, one of the first things we worked on was the Crescent Bay and Dream Deck demos, which for a lot of people was their first viewing of high quality VR content. We also made Toy Box, which was a showing of social VR, as well as one of the first unveilings of the Oculus Touch controllers. We made Farlands, which was a launch title for the Oculus Rift that delved deep into character interactions and schedule-based gameplay. We made Prologue, which was a new user experience for the Gear VR, which also really just showed off how great mobile VR and was very high quality. And then First Contact, uh, which we're going to talk about today. And I'm pretty happy to say that we can add two more things to this list that was announced yesterday. Uh, Boundless, which is the Santa Cruz experience featuring BOGO, and then the new home update for Rift Core 2.0. Yep. Uh, so to, to talk a little bit about the Touch Tutorial Initiative, we had a few goals coming into this. Uh, the first goal is we wanted to create a small experience. We wanted this to be a bite-sized experience something that didn't overstay its welcome so that it's easy to go through it and show your friends and family. We also had the goal of teaching not only how the controllers worked, but also to reinforce VR as a whole. For a lot of people going through this, this is not just their first time using the touch controllers, this is also their first time through VR in general. So we wanted to create a very magical experience that doubled down on presence. Uh, we also wanted to, taking inspiration from Toy Box and seeing the magic and success of that, uh, we wanted to give that to everybody else for their first time going through Rift. So we really strive to capture that same magic. So that led us to three pillars. Uh, teach, teach the controllers. Uh, delight, so we want to reinforce immersion and presence. And then evangelize, we want people to go out and show their friends and family. So here's a little bit on our timeline. Uh, it's important for us to show you um, the, the amount of time we spent to make this, just to give you context on the decisions that we had to make um, along the way. So the whole process started around mid-May, where we had um, pitch submissions from the team. The way Oculus Rex works is that we, you know, we are a small team, and uh, the team is encouraged to write uh, one-pagers, which are like little short documents of ideas for uh, games to make. And um, we, everyone was given you know, the, you know, the, the pillars that we were supposed to hit. They were about touch controllers. We wanted to make sure that whatever we make showcases and teaches those. So we had a range of pitches from everyone on the team. And these one-pagers are designed such as um, they're easy to digest and read so that we can vote on them and like, figure out what we're going to do. So you know, there was a range of them, everything from build a robot um, factories to like little uh, wizard um, experiences and whatnot. And out of these like, many, many p pitches, we picked three. So the, by um, June, we picked the three pitches we were going to do. And then we worked on them, uh, I, think, believe, I believe, from June to like early July. And then based on the three prototypes, which roughly took about two weeks each, 
two of which happened at the same time. We decided and found like um, what we were going to do as a full experience to work on. It gave us the confidence to sort of build first contact. So just looking at this timeline right now, I'm like realizing I'm getting those the same feeling again of like, oh my gosh, that wasn't a lot of time. So we had to make real concrete decisions based on those things we tried to do and carry them on in the little time we had to make the final product to launch in November of 2016. Man, that was a short time. Mm -hmm. So we did make three prototypes. Um, the first one you're seeing here is the wizard. This was a prototype that where we focused on uh, a voiced character-driven experience. So we have this little dragon here that would fly down. He would provide uh, voiceover instructions to the person playing. Uh, it would give the player a wand. You can use the wand to summon ingredients. And then on a list, you could then put in the right order of ingredients and get some different interactions out of this device. So some of the interactions we experimented with was a squishy ball, so you could actually pick it up and use the trigger to squeeze it. Uh, that actually felt really cool. That was a cool one. And then we had the fire breathing potion, which utilized the microphone so you could drink this potion and then breathe fire. Uh, the, one of the big takeaways of, of this prototype was um, while the character did provide VO instructions, it was also flying around randomly between these three tables. And we found that wherever, whatever table that dragon was at is where the person was keeping their focus the most. The next prototype here is Tiki Magic. Uh, this was a prototype that put the person playing uh, on a big stage uh, overlooking these pickle people. Uh, and they are a, a magician that are performing a variety of magical acts for these pickle people. Uh, <laughs> So there was kind of two key focuses uh, on this prototype. Uh, one that you're seeing here was we wanted to delve even deeper into character interactions. So uh, Pickle Man here would follow your hand, uh, look at you if you were kind of staying still, and we would provide the person these cards that they could then palm with, their, with the trigger. Um, and right away, like we all latched onto this. This felt magical, and we knew we wanted to carry this over to first contact. The other area that we focused on here as well was with face buttons and analog stick. Um, so we had a ocarina mechanic in which the user could hold this ocarina. Uh, it shared the same ergonomics as a touch controller, and by pressing buttons and moving the stick, it would play music, and then the snake would rise up. Uh, fun fact about this one, almost all the assets were built entirely in Quill. We had a pipeline to bring Quill directly into Unreal. So our concept artist at the time, who was concepting all this stuff in Quill, when he liked what he had, then that's what we had in VR. Um, and then the final prototype was Starlight. This one dealt deep with abstract uh, mechanics. So the user starts off in this void with this big blue sphere, and we kind of give them a moment to swipe their hands through it. It breaks up into tons of little pieces. It feels really cool. Uh, and then they're transported here. Um, and so we have a couple of cool little mechanics. So this one's the Firefly. When you close your hand, it would light up uh, and glow. And then when you let go, the Firefly would go flying away. We had comets that you could grab and throw around in the space. Uh, and then a pointing mechanic where you can point and light up constellations uh, in the space. There's also, you can see it in the background there, in some of these shots, uh, we had these ghost hands that would fly in to try to convey a point of interest to the person playing as well as convey what they should be doing with their hands. So here's um, some of our takeaways from these three prototypes. The first one is that we realize the difference between immersive and literal teaching and how they come into play. Um, you know, so just to elaborate on that a little bit, um, there were things that we needed people to be aware of as opposed, uh, um, in terms of the controller. Everything from where the buttons were, what they did, um, which actuation um, did things, which gestures did things. And then there's the immersive stuff where, you know, this is the world we're bringing you in, this is how you interact with the space. Those are two types of learning that we learned that if we smash them together, what ends up, what ends up happening is both suffer. And this really um, um, motivated us to do that split that I'll explain later. But this was like something that we learned from our work in Farlands. It, it, we learned this from the prototypes, that if we put these two very important things smashed into, uh, into the same space, cognitively, it's too much for a person to handle. And it's important, and it's OK to split them up. The th second thing we learned was that voiceover does not work on its own. More often than not, when people are in VR for the first time, the last thing that they want to do is just listen. They're just like, there's so much visual information around them. A robot telling them what to do or a dragon telling them what to do, if, that's, if all they're doing is talking, is not going to connect. Um, which leads me to the third thing, which is that we learn that movement, character movement, and telegraphing is very important. We learn from the dragon that his position in space or how his tail 
um, telegraphs to the next thing was ultimately more important as a UI tool than voice or text. And then we also learned that people want to interact with things in near space and far space within the play space. And so it's very important to really understand what you're creating, right? So if it's within arm's reach, it has to be interactive or you've broken a contract. This is something that we've learned in other games, but this is something we really learned to drill down into in our creation of the environment. We, we sometimes forget that there's a connection between what object we put in the space and the space we put it in and where it is in the space. Um, and the next thing on the list is that, oh, this is a pretty cool concept. So we learned about emotional contagion. So let me explain this a little bit. So as a phenomenon, um, emotional con contagion is that concept where you smile at a stranger and that person smiles back even before feeling happy because there's a mimicry that happens among humans. And then after you do that smile, that person then starts to elicit that same emotion because you've transferred it over through mimicry. This is something that works really well in film. You see characters like, say, Luke Skywalker or Harry Potter um, being at awe of the new world they're coming into because they are coming into a new world and they transfer that to you as an audience member and you're equally mesmerized by the new space you're in. And we saw this happen a lot with the Pickle Man. The Pickle Man was like clapping, it was giggling, it was so overjoyed about the magic that you were doing for him that we realized that that's what um, VR experiences seem to need. Um, we've realized that when people are in VR for the first time, their reaction is to stand there because they're unsure. They're, you've covered their eyes and they don't know what to do and sometimes they just stand there and they don't know how to emote. And so if you have emotional contagion to sort of like mimic from, then suddenly they're in a better place. And the last thing I wanted to mention as a takeaway is the idea that, you know, it's hard to follow instructions when you have no um, visibility of the controller, right? So we were asking people to understand things like pull the trigger, grab an object, but we were not putting the controller in the situation and we realized that it's okay. Show the controller, show the buttons, light up the finger that needs to actuate, like be very, uh, verbose about what you're teaching um, because uh, one thing we learned from Sky, um, uh, st um, Starlight. Starlight was that we had these like um, disembodied hands flying into space um, to show you what you're supposed to do and it did a couple of things. One, it was actually quite confusing because you would see a hand similar to yours fly and do something and you would feel like why is my disembodied hand doing things I'm not asking it to do and two, there was no controller there to like really show what buttons you're supposed to press. Which leads me again to this idea of a split, right? So we decided that if we are gonna do this touch tutorial initiative properly, we were gonna have to like teach two parts of the equation separately. And by that I meant we made touch basics, which is like really um, a you know, uh, conservative, like in your face, like tutorial that shows you everything that you need to know about button awareness and gestures, and then the empowering first contact. So let's talk about touch basics for just a little bit. Um, when we designed it, we had toy box in mind. By that I mean, uh, if anyone's ever like ran toy box, the way it works is that there's, there's two people in the experience, right? There's one hosting the experience and the other person um, joining and tagging along and having fun in that toy box uh, space. Uh, what normally happens when you're the host is that you spend the first five minutes teaching the, um, the person you're with some button awareness. You're showing them, okay, this is how this works, this is how it works. And then eventually you can have fun with them. So obviously if we're doing a new user experience, we couldn't make it multiplayer. And so what we decided to do was like simulate what that host would do in um, a toy box by making a tutorial that was just like heavily giving you everything you need to know. The next thing I wanna say about touch basics is that we used all the possible methods we use, or we could. Um, with the intention that we'll peel away what we don't need, but let's just put everything in. So we had like these things we called Noodle UI, which are basically panels of words with like Noodle VFX that sort of strung to either the buttons or the fingers that needed to actuate. We had glowing fingers and buttons that just really showed you what exactly you needed to do. We had like voiceover, we had subtitles. Um, and so we had everything in there. And the, the intention was we'll go to user testing, and then we'll take away what we don't need. But what we realized was that different people are in VR in different ways. There's people who will stand there, look straight, and not move, and just look at the subtitles. There's some people who are looking at their hands the whole time and never see the subtitles. And so there's many ways people come in. And so 
if you're making a tutorial, it's okay to just hit the hammer over the head and just give them everything. The last thing I wanted to say about, about Touch Basics is that we focus on accessibility. We knew that it was important for a platform level tutorial to not gate any experience. So um, as much as we, um, we assume that everyone coming into our tutorials will be capable of all motor functions, we were aware that some people may be missing a finger or a whole hand or unable to have motor functions on, some th or on the thumb. And so what we did was that through Touch Basics, if there was any moment where there was limited, uh, there was no activity for five seconds and it's listening for a button press, say, so let's say it's asking for press left trigger and you don't for five seconds, a little pop-up shows up that says, you know, gaze at this button to move on to the next instruction. Um, we did that so that we could accommodate accessibility. So once a user gets through Touch Basics, they are then transported to Oculus First Contact. And to kind of summarize what First Contact is, is it's a immersive experience that is there to teach not only the basics of the touch controllers, but to reinforce VR as a whole. So for those of you that are not familiar with First Contact, uh, here's the trailer. Coming into first contact, we had a few goals we tried to hit. Uh, one of them being, we wanted to keep everything simple and easily understood. Uh, we know our goal is to make this an immersive experience for people's first time in VR. And the more complex something is, or the more they have to spend time reading instructions, uh, the less immersive that experience is going to be. So if someone could look at an object and say, oh, I know how I'm supposed to use that, and I know what the call to action is, uh, the better. So the second goal that we were shooting for is we wanted to let people explore. Um, as much as a NUX can normally just be a set of rules and, and, and logic that you follow, uh, VR is very freeing, and we want people to be able to make this their own adventure through first contact. So while we have a set of core interactions that we want the, the player to perform and interact with, uh, we're pretty okay if you just go play with some of the stuff on the side or look for some of the hidden stuff in the, in the environment. Uh, we made the hard decision early on that um, it's okay if the player doesn't see everything. Uh, another goal is that we wanted this to be a character-driven experience from seeing the social interaction of Toy Box and what we saw from Tiki and uh, uh, the wizard prototype. Uh, the character is very important. So the character is there to help point to points of interest. It helps the user get feedback on what they should be doing. Um, and all around, I think, just makes this, ties this all together really well. And then the final goal for us was always acknowledge the player's presence. You know, they're, they're putting on this headset, they want to be taken to a different world, and any piece of feedback that reminds them that this headset is on their face, we're not doing our job. So any opportunity to acknowledge their movements, their actions, their interactions, uh, all of that matters. So there was a, a couple core beats in First Contact, and, and all of them taught something very specific. Um, and we'll run through a few of them here. So the, the first one, and then probably the most important one, is we need people moving their hands and we need them looking around. We found that uh, a lot of new people in VR are very stiff. You know, they, they look forward, they keep their hands to the side, um, but we need them to be moving. So the first task that they are given is to close the lid on the robot. So they're at least required to reach their hand out and turn the robot on. And once that happens, the robot goes to the other end of the trailer, waves to the, the person playing, and the person has to wave back. Um, and we found that by the end of this, people were starting to look around, they were starting to move their hands, they were starting to get into this experience. Once the robot reaches the user and comes back up front, um, it then that's where we start to teach grabbing for the, for the person in there. So the robot makes a clear call to action, grab this disc, and we give the person in there time to experiment 
and, and attempt to grab this. Um, one thing that we found, and we found this with the, the wizard prototype, is that when people would learn how to grab and they, find, and they get it, uh, they would drop stuff right away. And if it drops on the floor, now that gets more complicated. They have to bend down and then the track, and then it turns into a whole thing. So what we ended up doing is making it where the disc float. So we had the wand float in the wizard, uh, and that worked really well. So we have this kind of like zero gravity mechanic with the disc. So if you do drop it accidentally or misplace it, uh, it will move to a spot that is easy to access. So at this point, the player's feeling pretty competent. They're able to pick stuff up. They're looking around. They're exploring. And we want to start to reinforce hand presence. So we have this butterfly mechanic where butterflies come out of this printer. They land on the robot, explaining sort of how to do it for the player. And then the butterflies can land on the player's hand themselves. And what's interesting about this is that the butterfly is just light enough, uh, and it feels like they're actually walking around and that sort of stuff. Um, it's just a, a great magical moment. And then the next beat at this point is we actually go back to reinforcing grabbing and release. This is the most important thing. We have to make sure that people going through leave confident with this action. So we have two noisemakers here um, that are really cool because not only do you have to pick them up again, but you shake them around and move your hands even more at this point. And also, you have to put them back down, which is another skill uh, in its own. So uh, once they've gotten through this, then you know they're doing pretty good. And we present them with three options. Uh, one of these options, we call the surprise zero gravity moment. When they put this disc in, the whole trailer turns green. There's this cool hypercube effect. Everything lifts up in the environment. The robot floats up. And we give them about 30, 40 seconds to play in this zero gravity environment. This is virtual reality. It's not reality. So having these magical moments like this is important. And with the zero gravity state, there's actually a lot of cool emergent interactions and mechanics that can take place during this phase. Uh, there's another one, uh, the two-handed interactions. Uh, this is one where um, you will grab a rocket with one hand, you'll pull the string with the other. This was our, as far as in user research, was our highest performing uh, interaction. Uh, it feels very natural, and it's kind of all those skills coming together in one. Uh, the, the vibrations when you're pulling it back, the way it shakes in your hand. Um, early on, we observed a few times where this rocket would fly out, and it would come back to the player, and they'd either have to duck or they'd try to catch it. So we wanted to make this moment happen more often. So we, we kind of cheat just a little bit. And when that rocket hits something, it goes into a homing state, and it homes right back for the player's head. So we, we push that to be uh, a little bit more common. Uh, we also teach trigger. So we have a dart gun slash blaster that when you hold these, these targets spawn. And uh, interestingly, these are darts. It does look like a blaster, but you can stick them to the walls, and you can stick them to the robot. Um, we also found that the trigger feels very natural. Once they've gotten grip and they're picking stuff up, uh, we don't prompt how to use the dart gun. Everyone picks it up, and most everyone gets it and just starts going with it, and that's, that's awesome. So at this point, we have to come to a close, and we close on this wow moment where the entire trailer de out around the player. Uh, we want them to feel satisfied when leaving, so we close with this, but we also want to attempt to have context and narrative to why they're leaving this space. We want to try to keep that immersion going as long as we can. So the entire trailer de around, and when all the effects fade out and they're left in darkness, the next thing that fades in is home. Yep. So I know I said we um, front-loaded a lot of our um, immersive, sorry, literal teaching in um, Touch Basics, but there was still some need of some prompting from within, from within first contact. But we, when we did that, we still made sure that it was minimal, and it's in the style um, that you would make, uh, would understand to live in this world, right? So we had um, prompts that didn't have any text. We, we, we've done all the heavy lifting in the early part. This is just really just a reminder of certain things, things that start the experience. So the first one being this opening prompt, which encourages the player to extend their hand for, forward in VR, which we found was an issue for some people. Like a lot of people are sort of like unsure what the depth of VR is when they're first trying it out, and it was important to like teach them that there is something to reach out in front, and you have to actually make contact with it. Another thing that we did that was really um, effective was the idea of like telegraphing or telegraphing or moving prompts. Um, you know, you know this even from regular non-VR UI. If you had a, a piece of UI just pop in, pop out, and have another one pop in and pop out somewhere else, you may lose uh, the person trying to figure it out, right? So the best way to get them to go look from one thing to another is to telegraph the motion. 
And we did it with, we did it with these things where we had prompts that allow you to see that, oh, I have to pick this up from here and then take it over to this disk drive over here. This tested really well, and um, I would encourage this kind of like um, tutorialization if you, if you need something like this. Um, the other thing that we had were these contextual prompts. The idea is that these are not part of the uh, whole flow, but um, you know, if it you know if it's something that's worthy of teaching, and even if it's onto the uh, onto the side of the whole experience, maybe you should show how it's done. So in this case, there was a, a few of these like um, um, drop boxes that sort of like fell from the uh, uh, from the top of the trailer, and if you um, touched it once, it would show that you can punch it, and it'll teach you how to make the punching motion. Um, which leads us to the concept of loose guidance. The whole idea here is that. You know, there were there would be moments, as we were saying earlier, where the you know the person in the experience might just want to just poke around and play with a little van or stack some cans, and in the process, not be going through the whole flow that he's supposed to be following, and that's okay. Like we designed the experience so that you know, if in case you don't learn how to play with the rockets, it's okay. The experience will move along with you, and it'll take you to the next thing, and. Guess what? People will. This is an opportunity for rediscovery, and this is something that we embraced, and we knew that it was uh, going to be something that worked out. And sure enough, like um, you know, people on Reddit would start talking about all the stuff they discovered, you know, and they would find it, and then um, people would go back and play it again. So to talk a little bit about the environment, the RV itself. Uh, one key goal here was we wanted to design it in a way that didn't overwhelm the player participating. Uh, so when the player first hops into the RV, everything's dim, uh, all the monitors are turned off, all the interactions are not available. The only two things that a player can do at this point is play with physics objects, which if they do that, that's great, they're learning early, uh, or turn the robot on. Um, once they've turned the robot on and they get that boot disk and they put it into the trailer, then we turn on all the shiny things, we turn on all the buttons, and we start giving all those uh, awesome interactions, but we really just need to make sure that they can move forward at their own pace at this point. Uh, another thing about the environment, if it looks interactive, it's got to be interactive. If something looks like it affords an interaction and it doesn't, that's immersion breaking. So from everything to all the physics objects to buttons, the monitor you can turn on and off, the monitor gives a, an effect when your hand gets near it. It has a whole special hidden interaction if you stick your hand in the monitor itself. We have VHS tapes that you can insert and watch. Uh, they have some great references back to those same prototypes and back to Farlands, hanging physics. Uh, we have a flip switch that opens and closes blinds. We have a button that spawns more objects. Uh, we have a little soundboard off to the side. We fit a lot of stuff in this small environment, which kind of leads us to the final step here. Um, we let, we, our goal was to have all core interactions within an average arm span length. Um, not everyone has the luxury of having a lot of space, so everything has to be within reach in a standing space. Um, and this was something that was a little scary to us at first. Uh, it's one thing to go from these large environments and far lands to now this small and compact space. And while we're like, you know, we want people to explore and teleport around, uh, what we actually found is there's a lot to explore here. Uh, there's a lot of content. Which brings us to a little bit of a exploration of how the space was designed, right? So our art director started with um, a little bit more of a squarish um, uh, sort of play space. It was a lot more um, open, and, uh, but also a lot messier. But one of the key points of review that we had from within the team um, was that it was probably gonna be better, and it eventually was, to start with a space that was a little neater and more orderly so that the messing up the space belonged to the user himself, right? It wasn't like pre-messy, right? You, you create your own mess. So the space evolved to something neater and neater, and eventually we landed with something similar to this. This is actually an interesting image to share in that um, our art director for this project um, built out the whole space in medium because it allowed him to do a, a few things, right? Number one, he figured out, or we figured out like um, the best layout for the space. It created an um, understanding of the directionality. As you can see, we, we, we ended up with a space that was a little longer than it was um, wide. This was for a reason. The reason was that we wanted to make sure that the performance of the robot was always in a certain um, direction and you would always catch it. There was no reason to turn around and you had a, you're in a very um, perfect environment to like s sort of see the best 
a view of the theatrics of the robot. Um, another interesting thing about this is that you know scale was figured out very easily and quickly. Um, Richard and um, and uh, John like jumped into this a lot and just like tried to see um, the layout very early before like our environment guys like got into it and like really built it out. And it's interesting how a lot of these early elements really stuck. Like you can already see the the um, the 3D printer and all the computers in there. So let's talk a little bit about the character. I think he's pretty cool. These are some of uh, um, Gabo's original uh, illustrations of him. You'll notice that his his head was a little bit more rounded originally. Like there was a lot more like curvature to the original version. Um, a lot of exploration came into this. Like um, how does he fold away and where does, what the, what does his hand do? To, how does how do they articulate and whatnot? And then you know it evolved and got a little bit more squared out. He definitely has a lot of like 80s robot references, as you can see. Um, you know, this is a paint up by John, and then um, it progressed. And this is a model by Sean. The interesting thing to note about this robot right now is, you know, the, the thing I was talking about earlier about um, emotional contagion. There's a lot of back and forth between like design, art, um, tech art, animation to come up with this final look um, and all the articulation that it would get. I don't know if you can see it, but there's like little um, pieces of eye, uh, eyelids on top and bottom of this, this creature's eyes. And then there's like a fold out mouth that would you know, give you some 8-bit smiles and whatnot. And there's also like dilating eyeballs in there, or rather like discs that sort of simulated eyeballs whose purpose was to show excitement. And then um, he has like shoulders that could like slump down when he's sad. And the most important feature and, um, uh, is the neck so that there could be some animations where the body could be doing one thing, but still always looking at what's important. He would like be able to like turn his head and crane and like follow along to create that sense of presence. Yeah, so a little bit about the design side of the character itself. One key for us was to limit negative impacting interactions. And then what this means is uh, if the player tries to interact with the character in a way that we don't afford or, or, or does, they don't get the reaction that they were expecting, uh, that's a negative impact on immersion. So we made some key decisions to try to limit those. So one was no verbal language. There's no audible language that the player can understand. It's a lot of robot beeps and boops. Um, and one side effect of that is we found that people talked to this character a lot. Um, and because it was something that they didn't understand, they were interpreting it in a way that was meaningful to them. Uh, another thing that we did with the character is that we limited hand avoidance. Um, you know, it would be great if you could shake its hand, if you could high-five it, if you could start deconstructing it and grabbing it. Um, the problem is that that opens up a large can of worms of a ton of interactions that people can do that we're not even thinking about at this point. So what we did is we had where when your hand got near the robot, the robot would move away. And this was pretty effective. You know, a number of times we'd observe people say like, hey, do you want this thing? The robot would back up and they'd say, oh, okay, I guess you didn't want it. And then they would move on. And, and that's a, a reaction that makes sense at that point. Uh, also, uh, this thing was built to get knocked around. Uh, as soon as people learn how to pick stuff up, they're gonna start throwing things around. So we wanted something that was kind of physics-y and floaty. Uh, robot mundane reaction. It will get a little upset if you do throw enough things at it, uh, but you can knock this guy around and it, it makes sense in the universe. Uh, so going into a little bit more detail, the character also responds to a lot of subtle details. So when we strive to acknowledge the player's presence at all times, we focus on stuff like this. So the robot will follow your gaze. Uh, if you look left, the robot looks left. If you look right, the robot looks right. And this is important because if you're focused on an inter interaction, if you're playing with a little toy RV and you're looking at the RV, then the robot's also gonna be engaged with that toy RV because it's looking where you're looking at this point. Uh, we also have it where uh, we have the robot focus on movement. So based off how fast things are moving or how close things are to the robot, the, the robot will keep its gaze on those objects. And uh, it's great with the natural movements of the disc because when you're moving your hand, it's following your hand to the disc. When you're playing with interactions, it's watching the noisemakers spin around. The rockets are great because with that neck, it's following the rockets and twisting around as they fly around. And it just adds to that quality and, and those levels of detail that we want to strive for. Uh, we also have it where 
The character will respond to objects that are stuck or stacked on it. Um, you know, this does ha happen over time. Things will pile up on it. You will stick darts to it. And it's a subtle thing, and maybe not a lot of people will notice this, but for those that do, again, it's always acknowledging their presence and making this just a little bit more special for that person. And going even further, we have a few very obscure events, like for example, with this noisemaker, if you do spin it a lot, and you do have to spin it a lot, it will break and fall, and the robot will respond to that event. Again, this isn't something that a lot of players are gonna see, but for those that do, it just makes it that much more of a personal experience. Just real quick on the character um, as a UI tool. Um, we really, uh, you know, like I said, there wasn't a lot of like UI within first contact, but the robot sort of fulfilled that role, right? He, you know, he's, he's been used to like te telegraph like where your hands are supposed to go and what you're supposed to do in the space. And we really leveraged his, um, his animation and his like, character to like, really um, highlight what you're supposed to do in the space. Another thing that's important is that you know, he was basically um, like, uh, the, the, the UI tool. Like, in, a, in, a, in a part of the game where you've got a lot of disks floating around you, he would point at the next thing, and that was ultimately more powerful than maybe putting up another prompt in, in, a, in a slew of like, if, we're, if the space is already messy and there's a lot of things going on, adding another prompt would have just been uh, adding more noise to the, to the whole process. So we really leveraged the robot and its strengths. So I think we're coming up to lessons learned, but I did just want to add one real quick thing, which is that um, last year, uh, Tom Smerden and Pete Sterling did a talk about the audio of First Contact. We don't have their slides because they were busy making their own uh, presentation uh, actually the hour before us. But if you're interested in like the audio part of this aspect, please dig up last year's um, audio talk from, uh, from Tom and Pete. It's pretty cool. So we left First Contact with a few lessons that we learned. The first and the biggest one was that small spaces can pack a lot of content. Uh, we hid a lot of stuff in this space. Uh, we had a lot of interactions that a lot of people don't ever see. And, and we're OK with that. It's more important that this is your adventure through this in the end. And to kind of reinforce that even further, uh, the magic is kind of in all these details. In every nook and cranny, we tried to hide something. There's stuff under the table. Uh, we have stuff, if you land in a trash can far away, we have an Easter egg with, with confetti that shoots out. And, and it's really great, because as Dino was touching on earlier, we would see people post feedback on social media and say, I learned that you could do this thing. I can hold this dart in a way and throw it in this way. And the people say, oh, cool, I'm going to hop back in. That's cool. And having that reason to come back in because of these details was a big win for us. Uh, also, again, same thing we've kind of been talking about. Uh, we went in with the goal that we always want to acknowledge the presence of the person in there. Um, and we left feeling even more realizing how important that is. Uh, these slightest details can remind people that this is not a real world. It's all about making a plausible space, something that feels real and they feel like they can be a part of. Also, adding complexity uh, is not always the right decision. You know, in some of our early prototypes, we had some complex interactions and some complex mechanics, and they didn't land because players had to spend time learning, and it was a little bit frustrating at that point. You know, when things feel natural and very, very fluid, uh, and you get a good flow, uh, the more immersed and the more presence that a player is going to feel overall. Cool. So. Um we would be remiss to end this slide talk without saying that um, a lot of these lessons learned were not just from me and Richard, obviously. It's from a very dedicated, passionate team of um, artists, uh, designers, animators, uh, tech artists, producers, um, studio heads, who really made this project happen and really is the heart of what Rex is. Uh, we want to thank them. Some of them are here. So thank you for, for all that amazing work, Rex team. Um, Oh, oh, don't, don't want to preempt that. Sorry. Spoilers. Spoilers. Uh, yeah, so here at the you know, Rex team, we want people to enjoy VR. And, and that is our goal. That, that is our mission. Uh, the more that we can evangelize VR and the more others evangelize VR, uh, the happier that makes us. So when we see comments of people saying, oh, the T-Rex was really spooky in Dream Deck, and you know, I got to have these great character interactions in Far Lands, or I had this great experience with BOGO, uh, all that stuff means a lot to us. And there's one video in particular of a playthrough of First Contact that really caught our attention. 
Um, it actually reinforces a lot of the stuff that we talked about here today. Um, we brought that to show, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Ooh, glug, glug, glug. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ooh, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, what's this is telling me to do? It's telling me to... <gasps> and this is telling me... Push it down. <gasps> oh! Hello! Thank you very much. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll, we'll probably take, uh, if you guys want to talk to us, we'll be outside um, answering questions. But thank you for being here. Thank you so it's, uh, much. It's really important that we got to share all this. Thank you. Thank you.